We are now on the record. This is the Kentucky Public Service Commission. My name is Michael Schmidt. I'm chairman of the commission. Seated to my right is uh, Vice Chairman Robert Cicero, and to my left, Dr. Tina Matthews. Uh, we are here today for a hearing on the record in case number 2018-00017. Electronic application of Martin County Water District for alternative rate adjustment. Uh, the Water District has filed a motion for clarification of uh, certain <coughs> items contained in the uh, Commission's uh, final order dated Mar uh, November the 5th, 2018, and for a revised schedule of implementation. Martin County Concerned Citizens has filed a written response and then a corrected written response. And so the hearing today is to uh, consider the motions and to discuss uh, of what the commission expects of the district. So, uh, uh, Mr. Cumbo, do you have uh, your witnesses here today, Mr. Kerr and uh, Mr. Heisman? Yes, yes, we do. And I guess there's been a subpoena issued for someone from uh, Bell Engineering. Is Hello. Bell here? Yes, sir. Okay. Now, the purpose, <laughs> I guess, for your subpoena is uh, after the hearing, uh, uh, officials from the uh, Energy and Environment Cabinet would like to have a meeting. I don't know that we never explained that to you, but basically to discuss uh, some of the uh, uh, issues concerning or surrounding the AML grant. Yes. Okay. All right, so uh, Mr. Cumbo, uh, Mr. Uh, Kerr, I guess is now the, what, acting chairman of That's the right. commission. Before I, and I'd like to ask him, I guess, about the motion, but before he takes a stand, just for my own edification, uh, why is Mr. Kerr the acting chairman rather than the chairman? Is there some reason for that, or do we know? Or? I don't know. Okay. <laughs> I guess we just assume that after the first of the year, because we're going to have a couple of open seats, that we would actually do a formal vote once the new. Okay. Well, I didn't. I didn't know. Okay. Would you Would you please take the stand? The questioning here will be from me and the commissioners. Sure. Our lawyers will, might be uh, uh, tangentially involved some way, but but basically we try to understand. Uh, uh, why the motion was filed and what the confusion is. Okay? Okay, Mr. Kerr, will you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? Yes, sir. Thank you. Please be seated. Okay. Mr. Schmidt, could I, the, the representative from Bell Engineering, is he going to be a witness in this proceeding? Uh, I'm, I'm not sure that he is. I mean, I, I'd have to plan. Well, we, I, I understand. You now, we we just have to wait and see. Uh, uh, we subpoenaed him here for nine to make sure he was here at nine thirty because I think Secretary Snavely and, oh, okay. and others were going to be here at uh, at nine thirty. So okay. I get you know. one of the other commissioners may want to ask him questions. I mean, I I don't. So, I, but we had him here so that we wouldn't miss any time. We had this hearing at the uh, much to the consternation to some of our staff because there was an ugly sweater contest that, that is to be held immediately after this hearing because this was the Christmas party. Look, we could have done the end of the year. I wish I'd known. I could have wear that. I left mine in the car. My wife might be wearing the shirt because it was ready to be Christmas. We we didn't disclose that uh, intentionally. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, uh, I guess, uh, Mr. Curtis, just to clarify uh, for the record on history, uh, on, in January, on January 16th, 2018, uh, uh, Martin uh, County Water District, Martin District, filed a, uh, a proceeding for an alternative, uh, an alternative rate case uh, asking for an increase in rates. Were you a commissioner at that time? Yeah. Okay, when did you go on the commission? I want to say that I was sworn in January 2nd. Okay, all right. There's a, 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 an interesting thing about the, the physical court's minutes. I don't know if you're aware of that or not, but we'll, we'll talk about it in a second. Anyway, thereafter, I know there was testimony in, in one or two or more hearings 
about the emergency, uh, an emergency interim rate increase was required uh, because of the financial condition of the district and was unable to, to basically pay its bills. So on March 16, 2018, an emergency uh, interim rate increase was granted of 17.5%, uh, plus uh, the uh, commission on its own uh, uh, permitted a or ordered a $4.19 debt service charge to be assessed against the customers to pay down over $800,000 in debt to vendors. Uh, on November 5, 2018, a final order was entered, uh, which, uh, among other things, uh, directed the district to uh, solicit proposals from uh, uh, companies, independents, uh, uh, or others who basically uh, specialized in uh, providing managerial services to water utilities. Uh, there were five, uh, five private ent entities listed on, ex on Appendix B to that order and two public municipal entities being Paintsville uh, Utilities and Prestonsburg City Utilities. Uh, the order provided at page 22 uh, as follows under E. Under, before we got to E, under 4A, uh, the, the district said it was required to prepare and issue a request for a proposal, RFP, for operational management services to entities which specialize in providing such services, including but not limited to those entities identified in Appendix B, uh, present to the Commission a copy of each RFP issued by Martin District and each response to the RFP uh, received by Martin District. C, analyze with the assistance of its outside independent consultant each proposal received based on factors including but not necessarily limited to costs and qualifications, write each proposal in order of preferred proposal, and D, submit to commission a written report that discusses the results of the RFP solicitation for operational management of its water utility, including a detailed analysis supporting its preferred proposal, and then E, if Martin District fails to provide this commission the RFPs and all responses to RFPs, Together with the written report with supporting detailed analysis by January 30th, 2019, or if the Commission determines that the proposal prefer, preferred by Martin District is not in the best interest of either Martin District or its ratepayers, the debt service surcharge granted to Martin District in this case shall automatically terminate, become null, void, or no further effect, and all funds remaining in the surcharge account shall be returned to customers pro rata. I mean, it seems to me that portion of the order it's pretty clear in that uh, you were supposed to, between November the 5th, 2018, and January the 30th, 2019, uh, have uh, to the Commission uh, copies of the request for proposals, the proposals received, and to have ranked, analyzed, and provided to us uh, your uh, opinion or preference for which uh, uh, company or entity uh, would provide management services. Now, what is there about that that you or the other commissioners didn't understand? I had two primary questions. In one portion of the order, it talks about a contract manager. Mm -hmm. It says contract manager. So I would read that to be like a contract general manager, so to speak, because the commission has made it clear that we did not do what we were supposed to do as far as hiring a general manager, what you requested us to do, so that a contract manager was to be hired. And then later on in the order, it expands on it and it says a contract management company. So my primary question was, are we supposed to hire a contract manager or a contract management company that will run the whole thing. I mean, basically, you know, do we have a manager that comes in and just runs the district as is or a management company based on my um, research that would actually 
just take it all over, take the whole operations over. The intent, there was a discussion in this order of some, I don't know how many pages, probably 30 or so, uh, about uh, uh, managers and management and the commission's uh, body, the district, to hire a manager. You all apparently interviewed managers and weren't satisfied with them or something. That's correct. Uh, for that reason, the amount of money that was provided to the district to hire competent management was taken out of the rate increase. Right? So that no more than $9,000 was left in the rate increase for, to account for uh, management. At that point, it became clear to the commission that the only hope of salvaging this district's operations and putting it back into some type of operational competence within a reasonable period of time lay only with a management company or some other uh, municipal uh, uh, organization which had the capability to actually manage and run the district. Uh, that is why the ordering paragraph, all of the ordering paragraphs that begin on page 21 of the order uh, deal not with managers but with a management, with contract management or a management company. That's why in the list on Appendix B of potential management uh, entities, there is no human being there. The requirement was that proposals, requests for proposals be sent directly to the five independent uh, uh, management companies and the two public management companies directly because their addresses were actually there. But in addition to that, that was the minimum. Uh, you were to advertise for uh, contract management companies uh, uh, so as to, you know, perhaps interest others so as to get a, uh, as many people or groups as possible to do it. Uh, the, I know because I get calls, have gotten a number of calls from people in Martin County, businessmen and others, who, who take the position that we don't need contract management, uh, we can do this ourselves, to which I've said, well, why haven't you done that over the last 20 or 25 years? Uh, you know, it's like we all fly in, in airplanes, and if I take a Delta flight like my secretary did yesterday to San Francisco, uh, nobody's going to get on the plane unless the pilot has experience and the pilot's been trained. And I don't think there's any doubt in my mind or this commission's mind that there's nobody in Martin County who has any training. I think we all give you a good bit of credit for trying and working. And at some point in time uh, in the future, uh, if you wanted to be uh, a, the general manager, that might be a possibility. But right now, you don't have the background and the training and the expertise, and this isn't necessarily easy stuff to do. But I have heard that basically that you are not in favor of, of contract management because you intend to be the general manager yourself. Is that, that is true? not true. No, I mean, we have discussed that, absolutely among other options. But the only thing that we discussed was it being on an interim basis until we could get the management company hired. I am absolutely in favor of a management company. If I could hire one tomorrow, I would hire a management company tomorrow so that I could stop doing what I'm having to do every day. Well, we'd like to see that as well. I would love Because that. the management company, if the management company can make a go of it, everybody benefits. Yes, I you, disagree. With all that. of the customers, the district as a whole, and you get the benefit over a few years of seeing, get, you'll get policies, procedures, uh, you, uh, purchase orders. You'll have a whole, a whole, an accounting system, and you'll have the whole thing set up for you at some point in time if you decide to make the change or you may be satisfied with it the way it is. Let me, can I, can I say yes. something? Let me say this. 
when we first got the order, I could not have been more mad. I could not have been more frustrated. I thought your opinion after it was unnecessary. I understood it. But I think that, kind of looking back on it, it was not so much that I was mad, it was that my pride was hurt. All right, and it was, I'm a proud person, and all the things that you just listed, I know how to do, every single one of them. And so, I was upset. And I was kind of to the point where here, just take it. You know, I mean, we're trying, we're working our tails off. You don't trust us to do this. Now, you get mad when I say trust, but it's not that you trust us. It's just you don't have the confidence in us to do it, and that's how I took it. Well, then the emotion subsides, and I start to think, and I start researching management companies. And a management company is exactly what we need. It's exactly what we need. I think for the long-term health of our water district, look, <clears throat> it's easy, I, I guess, and it's not the right way to say it, but to sit here in Frankfurt and say, we'll do this, this, and this, and be in it every single day. And it'll be your water district, and, and you care about it in a way. My wife says I take it entirely too personal, and I do. I take it incredibly personal. But once you sit down and you really think about it, it's what we need. I didn't, was it discussed of me being the general manager? Absolutely. We absolutely had that discussion amongst many, many other things. Many things. And, but it was never to be the full-time general manager because if there's one thing I have found out, that number one, I understand the finances, I understand, I don't understand the, the water system as a whole. That's not what I do, it's not what my strength is, it's not the reason I'm on this board. My business has taken a great impact because of the time that I've had to put into this to keep us from failing. And I need to be able to step away from the day to day and actually be a board member and give direction and not be involved in the day to day operations. Now, when I look back at the order, does I have concerns? And part of the clarification, I guess, that I wanted today is I do have concerns about a management company because from all the research I can do and everything I've looked into that this was tried back in the 90s and that there was a bid given, but then the company came in and what they billed every month was way more than what they bid and the county ended up in a bunch of debt and ended up having to break that contract to keep them from basically bottoming out the water district. So I still have that concern. And But as far as do I want to be the manager, not really, and definitely not long term. I am not a water, I can do the water board thing, I've been on a thousand boards and I can direct, but I can't, I can't do it. It is, um, it's just not feasible for me to continue to run my business and do that too. Um, well, I, I understand, and I understand why you would say, well, uh, people would be upset. I mean, my concurring opinion, in my opinion, uh, was uh, accurate. If, if anything, it may have been understated. In order to try to give your new judge executive some uh, uh, information as to what really has gone on in Martin County over the last 20, 25 years. Because I, I know people would call me on the phone and say, oh, it's all the fight of management. We just, have, we just have old infrastructure. There's nothing wrong with management. And of course, my response is, man infrastructure isn't the problem. Manage, bad management was the problem, which caused the infrastructure for delay. We, we interviewed a woman for uh, a, a, a commission seat in western Kentucky and they've got a little water district that only has four or five hundred people. They haven't had a rate increase in several years. They get they take in twenty five thousand dollars more than than they spend. They've got an eight point two percent water loss and it's well managed. And we have a, a dozens of, of water districts like that. They're developing their own infrastructure replacement plan even though they don't have any leaks because they're going to fix it so they never have a leak problem. But in any event, I called a judge-elect, Bill Davis, and I went up and met with him, and I gave him a notebook like this that was indexed that had the history of the Martin County Water District from the late 90s up through the present. 
and it had the orders. It had orders that agreed orders that were signed by Greg Scott when he was the chairman, and not one thing was ever done. I've got a, I've got it here. Years later, Martin County Water District finally prepared and filed with this commission in Ju July of 2011 a, its water loss prevention plan, and it had about five. It was well written, but every everything it was going to do, we're going to do valves. We're going to get a plan to replace pipes. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. We're going to do uh, everything. If, as money becomes available, and now what it says, as funds, as, as finances funds become available. Bill. They never asked for one rate increase. Never asked for one. Down. They never intended for funds to become available. I've got people back here who can come here and swear today that Kelly Callahan came to this Public Service Commission and told our people there'll never be one rate increase in Martin County until everybody in the county has, has public water. Now, I'll tell you what, if I had been on the commission, we would have taken some action, if nothing more than to publicize it in the Courier Journal, uh, but, but there would have been something done about that. But water district commissioners owe no duty to the county judge, he appoints them, or the fiscal court. They have a fiduciary duty, as Mr. Cumball will tell you, to the district and to its customers. And the district and the customers have one thing in common. They want clean water, reliable water every day at a reasonable price, and a reasonable price includes periodic increases so that the infrastructure can basically supply the need. You know, uh, if your water loss was from 70% to 15%, you'd have an extra $200,000 plus in your pocket, and these people could get a rate reduction. I agree. I mean, and it's not your fault. Know, you weren't on there. I understand. All right? Well, all I'm saying is I'll saying. be glad to give you a copy. I've got a copy if anybody <laughs> wants one of, of, of that. And that's but, what I was saying about the opinion. Is not at first, I was saying at first when I read it. Yeah. No, I understand. I was, I was just angry. I was like, I can't believe this. I was shocked by it. I was just like, I, I wasn't expecting it, I guess. But after I calmed down and well, started thinking, that, that it was just was written, okay. Because I wasn't sure who, if people knew, if Ms. Cromer or her clients knew about the history. You know, not everybody sure. watches this on the, on the World Wide Web or the Internet or whatever or, or gets these orders. So I thought it was important that people knew what the history was, why our decision was made the way it was, and basically that, that, that we intended to do the best we could for the people of Martin County. But I'm glad to hear that, that it's not your intent to uh, leave your job and become Lord, no, permanent manager. It is, it is my full intent <coughs> but, to comply with that order as quickly as I guess that can be done. One of the things that, oh, we're going to talk about that in a second, but one of the, one of the things that concerned me was that Ms. Cromer, uh, I guess wondering what the uh, status or progress was on, on requests for proposals filed an open records request on November 29th for communication between uh, the Water District Commissioners and uh, and Mr. Heitzman and maybe Big Sandy Ad District, is that correct? Uh, from September, sometime in September, through the, the 29th of, uh, of November 2018. And the response was, is, well, we're too busy, uh, but we'll get that to you in 30 days, which was, uh, would be December 28th, all right? Do you, did you see the open records request? Mm -hmm. uh, how much correspondence is there between the Water District and Mr. Heitzman and Big Sandy Air District uh, between September 1, 2018 and November 29, 2018. I would say the majority of the correspondence is probably between Greg and Big Sandy Ad, right? I mean, if I was guessing, you know, I kind of, you know, the order said to work with our consultant. Uh, I had a conversation with the staff attorneys that reiterated that, and so that's what I've done. And uh, kind of turn it over to him. I don't have the expertise. Uh, no, to I understand. I understand that. that. I guess the yeah. only question is: is when did the after the order of November the fifth was published, uh, and the district got a copy, commissioners got a copy. Did you all have a meeting and discuss it? 
say that again now, I'm sorry. Was there a meeting to discuss how to comply or what to do to comply with the commission's order of November 5th, yeah, 2018? Yeah, we spoke. I'm pretty sure the three of us spoke, um, myself, Brian, and Greg, and talked about, you know, what our options were and trying to digest that order, you know, just to make sure we understood. Well, the, the reason I ask is, is that if the order came out on November 5th, uh, had, was Mr. Heisman commissioned to start work on it shortly after November yeah. 5th, or was it only after Mr. Cumbo filed this motion on December 7th? Oh, no. No, 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 no. It was immediate. I mean, it was immediate that we started. I think on November 12th, if I remember correctly, I messaged Brian and said, hey, there's a couple things I don't understand, you know, that I want some clarification on. And then we started talking about the time frames. Um, I think Greg... We had a conference call, didn't we, at your office, if I recall correctly? We had a conference call and kind of discussed what our options were, and then the, I guess the schedule itself was discussed. And, uh, you know, I just told Greg, I said, you know, you do what you think is the right thing to do. You know, you know how to do this, not me, and do your thing. So those questions, as far as time frame, really need to be asked to him. Um, but I think the first time that I messaged Brian, I think it was November the 12th. I'd have to check my phone. but. Um, I said, hey, there's a couple things I don't understand. You know, can we file a motion for clarification on a couple of issues? But the motion for clarification was filed 32 days after the order was entered, mm -hmm. and that's 32 days. I mean, the, obviously, uh, nothing has apparently substantive has been done toward drafting a request for proposals as of this day. Is that yeah, correct? Yeah, talk to Mr. Heisman about those things because I've turned every bit of that over to him as far as getting that prepared. My part has been to, uh, once the, the RFP is ready and we do get some uh, candidates, to essentially kind of put a group together to review those that would include the concerned citizens, uh, the board members, and you know uh, maybe some of our newly elected officials to help grade, you know those and, and rank them, and then I'll I'll take charge of getting the write-up done uh, with Heitzman to get that over to you. Well, I assume that Big Sandy Ad would be helpful. They are, yeah, and I'm right. assuming Greg is working. I've talked to Monica several times. You know, I've checked with her. Hey, have you guys got anything done? No, not yet. You know, there's been a, a concern about the time frame, even from Big Sandy Ad from the beginning, uh, about can we get this done this quickly and put it out and give enough time to have response. Um, but yeah, no, I mean most of that conversation is taking place between Mr. Heitzman and, and Big Sandy Ad, and not myself necessarily. Well, I'll tell you what, I've done some work on my own, and uh, I got a, a management company to send me a timeline. You know what they told me? They told me that the earliest would be 45 days, but there's no reason why that you couldn't have all this done and the proposals in and be ready to hire in 60 days. And quite frankly, I got some information here on the Big Sandy ads from the city of Sagersville, where they had an advertisement for a request for a proposal for operation, maintenance, and management of all facilities, June of 2012, and they intended to hire in August. Mm -hmm. And I've got another one from Troublesome Creek Wastewater District that has the timelines too. Again, I was I followed the order and what I was told to do, which was to work with Mr. Heitzman. And any questions about that timeline need to be addressed. Whatever again. Mr. Heitzman does or doesn't do, the district's ultimately responsible. I understand that. For it. But the it's order like states that have to the federal government in last week and, and they were in trying to help us wanted us to help them collect their money from a rural water district that couldn't pay back its federal loans and uh where they you know they 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 waited until the, the district where we had about two and a half weeks left before the end of the year to file for some relief before they had to go into receivership and the, the, the government employee said well I told them, you have to learn how to manage your engineers and manage your lawyers. But they wait because they knew in September that this was needed. And they waited until early December to file it. So all I'm saying is, you know, it's okay, but there aren't, there aren't, there are, there, there, there's really no excuse that for at least coming back and saying, asking for an informal conference or something with people here if you had some kind of question uh, but let me let me say this and I mentioned this to, to Judge Davis 
I, I, the, there's a book, you know, it's, it's kind of outdated, but it's still mostly correct in everything that you all do. And it's Laws Affecting Public Utilities in the Commonwealth of Kentucky Annotated, 2013. We'll send you one if you want it, or you could, you know, the Kentucky Legislative homepage has all the updates on it. And, it, and when water districts are formed, the county judge and fiscal court stagger terms initially. And from that point on, the terms are what the terms are. And if someone, uh, someone dies, the person appointed fills the unexpired term. Right? When the term's up, the person can be reappointed or they can hold over or whatever. But the term goes on. In December, on December 7th, 2017, the Martin Fiscal Court held a meeting. And Mr. Horn filed this, I guess, with his response to our uh, proceeding to show cause why he shouldn't be removed for not having training. But here's, here's what the minutes say, and it's in the record here. I'm glad to get you a copy if you need it. I gave a copy of this, I think, to, to Judge Elect Davis. Under appoint water board members, judge executive addressed the court, stating the terms of the water board members have to be staggered. Now, they had to be staggered 40 years before he did this. He recommended a one-year term for John Hensley and Rex Endicott. Their term will end December 2018. Jimmy Don Kerr and Jared Crum, a two-year term. John Horn, a three-year term. These terms will be from this day forward. This will make up a full water board. Judge Executive Kelly Callahan told Mike Crum he would have to go up to the water company and swear in these new board members and conduct the meeting the following Monday. Motion to accept these water board members was made by Magistrate Josh Muncy, seconded by Magistrate Victor Sloan. It was a unanimous vote. But there's our, our statutes, KRS 74.020. I won't go through and read all these in the record. Mr. Cumbo can look at them. Whoever the new county attorney is can look at them. But the terms are set. The staggered terms in the beginning were two years, three years, and four years, not one year, two years, and three years. And I don't think, I doubt seriously if the physical court at this time has the authority to change, not only change the terms, but if Mr., if, if two of these people uh, that had, that they said had one year, uh, Mr. Hensley and Mr. Endicott, if they're fulfilling somebody else's term who resigned, they may have two or three years left. And he's re illegally removing them from office by trying to appoint them. Anyway, whatever it is, somebody ought to look at it because if, there's a, if it's contested, it'll either be in circuit court or it'll be back down here. Uh, and for whatever, for, for whatever it's worth. Uh, I would also like to say, and, and this isn't by way of a threat, but, but the, the Public Service Commission has uh, authority to remove board members for malfeasance, misfeasance, nonfeasance, for disobedience to an order of the commission or for a violation of the statute and regulation. And the, the uh, commission uh, essentially uh, can hold a hearing and after the hearing make a determination as to whether the commissioner is removed or not. And if the commissioner is removed, the statute provides for no appeal. There is no appeal. If the, if the county judge tries to remove a magistrate, he has to give notice at least 10 days by registered mail, have a hearing and a court reporter and go through the whole process. The physical court has to actually vote, and then there's uh, that his decision, or the physical court's decision, is subject to appeal. Right? So, one, uh, that authority exists on behalf of the commission. There is also authority under KRS 
278, I guess 999, where, and we've actually exercised this authority. 278.990 penalties. Any officer, not just board member, anybody acting with in, in coordination with board member, any officer, agent, or employee of a utility as defined by KRS 278.010 and any other person who willfully violates any of the provisions of this chapter or any regulation promulgated by us to this chapter or fails to obey any order of the commission from which all rights of appeal have been exhausted or who procures, aids, or abets a violation by any utility shall be subject to either a civil penalty to be assessed by the commission not to exceed $2,500 for each offense or a <coughs> criminal penalty of an imprisonment for not more than six months or both. Actions to recover the principal amount due and penalties under this chapter shall be brought in the name of the Commonwealth in the Franklin Circuit Court. Now, all I'm saying is, I'm not accusing anybody in Martin County of acting in bad faith. But, you know, <laughs> we've had differences of opinion over the course of this case on, on, on whether something was filed on time or whether it was adequate or whether it wasn't. Moving forward, uh, if there's a lack of, of serious compliance I mean you can expect that we're going to enforce these orders with every uh, provision of the law that we're allowed to exercise it's just as simple as that and if people don't want to do that in Martin County they need to get off the board you know if there's a problem you can call us right if there's a problem we can work it out but but when I saw when I came back from my meeting with the judge uh, elect and I saw Mr. Cumbo's motion, I basically was upset because I thought this is, this is where we're going with it. If I were going to try to sabotage uh, uh, contract management, I wouldn't, uh, I wouldn't confront the PSC directly, but I would delay and do whatever I could to basically fix it so like the commission, the water district has done over the last 20 years, just delay and figure somewhere along the line somebody will, will miss it or somebody's term will expire or they'll just say, oh, heck, give up on it and go away. But we're not going to give up on it. And we're not going to go away. And if you guys want to litigate it somewhere, we'll litigate it and you can spend every dime that ought to go on Miss Comer's to help Miss Comer's uh, customers on, on legal fees. So that's up to you. I don't think you have to worry about that, sir. I have every intention, and I know the rest of the board does too, of complying with your order or with the order of the commission, <clears throat> every intention. Because it is, look, you want to fix the water district, so do I. So do I. I mean, I put up a lot of crap this past year. I mean, I sit and look back, you know, kind of reflect. I, on I, I know you have. I, I know you have. I want the same thing that you want, and I truly do. And I believe that, you're, like I said, I got some reservations. But I think the RFPs, when we get those, we'll maybe settle those or confirm those. Um, but at the same time, I think we need, it was so broken when we took over. It was so broken, and it's still broken. Now, it's light years ahead of where it was. <laughs> I mean, it's still not good, but it's still, it's light years ahead of where it was. But to truly fix our system, we have to have experience management. I don't disagree with any time you've ever said that. My contention was always I can't pay for it. Well, we'll know? see that you get the money. Yeah, that was the thing. That was, and that's the, I guess, kind of leads me to my other question. I guess the other clarification that I had was say that in three months, I find a management company that we like and that you like and that we all agree upon and we want to hire them. But I can't hire them because I can't pay them until until I get the capital improvement plan completed. Here's here. here let me tell you. Here, here's how it's going to work. For one thing, you don't have to worry about the capital improvement plan. Uh, we're going to draft a, a, a change. Let me tell you why the capital improvement plan was worded the way it was. The 
capital improvement plan was initially just a capital improvement plan. But because we recognized, since we had to take out the money that would have gone for a, a, a competent manager under the guidelines of what Mr. Heitzman had testified to, right, we decided, and that's why one of the reasons we left the case open subject to change is we left that surcharge in there so that we could kick in an extra hundred and twenty, twenty-five thousand dollars a year if we needed to get it in to where we could get we could get management in place if that was necessary. Right. And if it wasn't, we'd have some left over. Okay. But but the the deal is here, here's how we're going to do a and we need to talk to Mr. Heisman if, if he thinks it's necessary. Uh, We've got a timeline right, that I, it depends on what maybe what Mr. Heisman says and, and maybe not. But, but the timeline is, doesn't go into requests for, for, for interested parties. We get right down to the nitty gritty and see if you can get anybody interested or not. But along the way, you're going to be supplying things to us and we're going to have at least two conferences like this where you can come in with proposals and we can talk about it and where we can grant final approval of who it is you hire and approve your contract. Okay. And, and our stick in that, uh, or carrot, whichever way you want it, is basically this surcharge money, which puts you in a position, if you don't have it, you know, it's just a question of six months to a year and you're broke. Right. You know, I mean, right, exactly. That's just the exactly. Yeah, and that's where my the, question was. The, the, was your local people ain't gonna get paid. Right. I mean, that's that's the exactly. Line. And that was my question. Is you know, <laughs> and that we don't was the mean that. Is anything personal against you? But, I know that. But these people here in the public, you know, we're under a lot of scrutiny too, and and that's all right. I don't mind. We're going to be responsible for whatever we do, right? And we ought to be responsible for it. And if it fails, it's on us. But we'd like to see people, we'd like to see these people have a chance at getting the system fixed. I saw Angie Hatton had this thing in the newspaper the other day about uh, they wanted some bill about everybody ought to have equal right to water. We have said this in hearings, she wasn't here, back as long as a year or two ago that every citizen of Kentucky, whether in Martin County, Letcher County, Floyd County, Pike County, Harlan County, you have just as much right to good, clean drinking water on a reliable basis as people do in Lexington or rural. Just like a doctor in a malpractice claim, his standard of care in Inez is the same as it is at Jewish Hospital in Louisville. I mean, just how it is. So we want to help you. And, and I, I know we, we, nobody likes that you say, well, you're just talking down to us or talking bad to us. The frustrating part we have is that Martin County has never complied with one thing over the years that this commission has ever done. And, you know, come hell or high water, we're going to do the best we can to see that doesn't happen again. I'm with you. Okay? It'll working be done. together, maybe we can do some good. And, you know, when we talk about the customers, I'm one of those customers. I live there. I mean, I buy the water. I am a concerned citizen, just like you refer to Ms. Cromer's clients. I'm one of her clients. I'm well, one of those people. Well, I, I think that's right, and I think, uh, I, I know Judge Davis, I hadn't uh, seen him since uh, March of 1964, but he played basketball for Warfield when I was at Paintsville, and I assume he's, he and, uh, and uh, 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 Kathleen Price, the chairman of the school board, who I've known for several years, all were from that area and ought to want people to be able to take a bath on occasion, you know, or <laughs> more, more than occasionally. So. All right, let me, let me ask Mr. Heisman, we put him under oath here, but look, we've got, if, can you get a request for proposal out by the first of the year? I mean, if you just, I mean, a lot of it's boilerplate, isn't it? You just have the, uh, for complete it's management it's services. It's appropriate for me, yeah. It's not appropriate for you? Well, uh, to be under oath, I'd like to. You'd like to what? Engage in some dialogue to make sure I understand the scope. He wants to bend her oh, you want to you want to take the stand? Yes, All right. Anybody have any yes, other sir. questions? I, I just have a couple of questions. Yes, sir. The chairman mentioned about 
that nobody's going to get paid if, if the surcharge doesn't go into effect. Ha has any payments been made to any of the vendors that have outstanding balances? I knew you put a plan in place. Yeah, no, we have. Okay, so I you've think been. I'm pretty sure the last filing had that statement that showed those checks coming through that surcharge account. Did it? I felt like I saw it. Did. I saw it. it did. Yeah. Okay. No, we did. No, we actually, our accounts payable actually went down from because of that. But yes. Yeah. That's number one. Number two, just for the record, can you state what your preference would be for the $3.4 million grant money? I've heard, and this is for my clarification, I've heard that it's best spent on the water plant, and then I've heard comments that no way it might be better spent on service lines or mains. Can, from the Martin County, County Board's perspective. I'll tell you what I think, yes. Yes, please. So let me qualify by saying I'm not an engineer, okay? That's <laughs> I'm not an engineer. I look at everything that I look at from a financial perspective, okay? The argument is made, and it's not, it's all important. Every phase of it's important. And right now, our intake, if we don't have water, if we can't get water to our plant and clean it, then we can leak 75% of our water out and it wouldn't matter because we don't we wouldn't have water to begin with so i understand that part of it okay but for me what i look at i would rather do main and service line replacement that is my preference and i would think probably the preference of the board because it's not what necessarily we've been advised i mean really what the engineers i'm going to follow what the engineers tell me just like i'm going to follow what greg tells me on this rfp because I'm not an engineer, but well, don't worry. When Greg gets up here, I'm going to be asking. Him okay, there. so my personal preference would be service line replacement because I mean we're literally we produce two million gallons of water a day, and we really only need like eight hundred thousand, really. So you just think about what that could save us from a financial standpoint, as far as we wouldn't have to run our plant twenty four hours a day. The electric bill would be half. Our chemicals will be 75% cheaper. I mean, you know, it, to me, that makes the most sense. And that is what I have put my energy into trying to obtain grants and, and the other things. Now, most of the grants that are working right now were done before I, we ever took seats on the board. So if the engineers feel like that the scope of the project, the best thing to do is to work on the intake and plant, then I will go along with that. But my primary concern is mains, mains really, main lines, um, and then services. That's what would be my preference. But at the same time, I understand that if we don't fix the intake, because it is, it's, I don't know, they'll, Heisman can talk about it, but I mean, it's not good either. None of it's good. You know, it's just financially, it would make more sense to me to fix the service and the mains. Um, but as far as having water, I mean, that intake really does need to be repaired. And we have a clarifier down that right now. We can't take, if we have another clarifier go down, then we can only produce half of what we have to produce every day to keep water going. And so there's definitely a need to work on that, to get that third clarifier up. We know, there's, we know that there's a lot of different issues. It's a matter of, I, I was curious what the prioritization of those issues are. Yes, I understand the water plant needs repairs, There's, you're running right now on probabilities of whether it will continue to run or not, Yeah. but you also already have a known water loss rate yeah. that is close now, to 70%. This board's priority, because like I said, these other grants, the one the AML that we have now, that was done before we came on board and the scope was, you know, with the economic development tie-in and all those things, um, was kind of set in place, and I will absolutely follow the, the lead of our engineers on that. So why we're we there, um, but our priority moving forward, and one of the things that when we do start interviewing management companies is how do we reduce this water loss? Because it flips the entire script for us if we can get that water loss in check. I mean, it's insane. I mean, you know it. I know it. I mean, I sit there and look at it, and that's what the guys are out doing every day is trying to figure out how to get the leaks down. We'll work. We've ended up fixing like. I think it was five or six PRVs, the pressure reducing valves that were probably blowing our lines out because they weren't fixed. But we finally have gotten around to actually being able to do some water work. And they've been out rebuilding those and, and doing those things. But no, it's all about service line and main line replacement for me. 
well, you expressed your frustration with the order when it came out. And I'm going to let you know from my perspective, and I'm, I'm pretty sure the other two commissioners' perspective, is that when I first got involved in the Martin County water situation and the chairman recused himself, I thought it was going to be one of those that the, there was going to be a solution to what was a very serious problem. And I can tell you that all Martin County has done is probably been the leader in what has turned out to be several water districts that are starting to experience the same problem. But I've learned that the state government doesn't have as much authority as, well, at least the commission doesn't, as I would like to have seen it had. And I know that can only be changed through a statutory regulatory situation. But if we had more power to impose what we think should be done, then the order probably would have read differently. I think we did to the extent what we were able to do under our jurisdiction. But it also was an, it gave us the opportunity to highlight the fact that we would like to focus legislators' uh, attention on the fact that you're expecting us to address these issues, and yet we don't have the authority really to do that. So you being the, unfortunately, <laughs> the prime dog in this hunt, uh, you know, and uh, lots of issues to address, your, your focus is going to, we're going to focus on you until we get this straightened out. That's fine. And in whatever way we can, and to focus the, the situation so the legislators may realize that you have many more Martin counties down the road if something isn't done. Like I said, I promise you, I assure you, I will lead the board as long as I am the chairman, and we will follow every step of that order, and we'll work with you in every way we can because I want the exact same thing that you want. That's the only reason I'm in this. I, I want to fix the water district, and if... Like I said, it's almost like an addiction for me at this point. I mean, really, my wife wishes I would resign right now. And I have taken a lot of time away from my family. I've taken a lot of time away from my business. And the faster we can get a management company hired, the happier I will be. <laughs> so I will absolutely, I promise you, comply with everything in that order. And if you need me direct, you just call me. I'll do whatever I need to do. I think the commission would love to see you be a success story. We will be. I'm not going to be broken. I'm going to. I'm going to make it. And no matter what is said to me here, no matter what is said to, about me on social media and the paper, I have the resolve and the thick skin to survive this, and I'm going to help fix this. It is my absolute mission at this point uh, to do that, and I believe that this commission has that exact same resolve. Uh, and will not let up and, and not let me slide. So, <laughs> I can so assure you that is the case. Yes, and uh, but just know that I'm with you, and I, I want the exact same thing that you want. I promise that, and I will not. I will not stray from that. Thank you. I don't have a I would just the only thing I would say is if you have a question for clarification, don't wait 32 days to ask. Yeah, I understand. Okay. Yes, I, I mean, we're not, we're not ogres. Maybe I am, but, you know, <laughs> uh, but just, you know. That's fine. Have, I, your, have your attorney pick up the phone. Yeah, I think, I, like I said, I, I read it. it. I mean, I've read that order a hundred times. Maybe you need to not read it. If, I do. I don't. I had to quit. Stop obsessing. Yeah. But, and I think it was. I think it came out on the seventh. And I think by the time I got myself together, I believe I messaged Brian on the twelfth. I think I'd have to check and see. But anyway, and because I was like, this doesn't. It, it almost felt like it was written by two different people to me. I mean, like when I read it, it was like, okay, this doesn't make sense. And then I'm always worried about the money part. So I will absolutely make sure <laughs> next time. And, and the money part is, you know, at the end of the day, when you're treating two million gallons of water and you only need eight hundred thousand, yeah. You could be shutting pumps off Look, 16 hours a day. It would be unbelievable. I mean, like, I've actually ran the numbers, <clears throat> what it would do. Like you said, it was like 200,000. 200, I think that's exactly what it, I was in that ballpark of what I could say. I mean, it was just like, 
all right, I need to fix the water loss. So that's what I'm obsessing over. And I haven't been able to get any real traction yet, but that's what I'm working on. So. 200000 a year. What's that? I'm sorry. 200000 a year. Yeah, a year. I mean, think about that, what that could do for us. We could, I mean, we could, we could pay off those bills, and then we could come back down here and say, we don't need all that rate. Let's lower that rate back down. Your citizens would love it, I can assure you. I would love that. And I'll pay about six or seven different water bills. It would fix infiltration. Well, we have applied for some money to, not that it matters, but it's relevant to this hearing, but we've applied to have a hydraulic uh, model done. And we applied for another AML grant, and then as part of that grant, we applied for a capital improvement plan and a hydraulic model for the system, too, because we think a lot of our problems, now that we've been actually able to get out in the system and actually work a little bit, is, has a lot. It's all pressure related. A lot of it is. It's not laid out properly. So, and then obviously the leaky lines. So, yours and again, there's. You're not alone. You may feel alone, but you're not alone. As I said, I think I was quoted as saying. In, in that regard, regard, water districts are the only utilities that we deal with, where we half the time. The financial analysts recommend more money than they ask for, and they refuse to take it. Uh, we're now embarked on a program of trying to make them take it. Uh, you may have seen, I guess it was something in the paper maybe the other day, we, we, we uh, have opened a case for all water companies in the state on water loss issues. That is a predicate to another case that's going to be open that you all will probably be involved in, and it's going to be a, of the six to eight wor worst water loss districts in the state uh, and would hopefully lead to some kind of pilot program uh, that we can try to institute uh, outside the framework of the statutes, which we're not likely to ever get, uh, which would allow us to and them to address water loss issues by making infrastructure improvements through mandatory surcharges. See, I love the surcharge idea. Like, I love that idea. And when it's over, it's over. It's over, right. And see, I actually love that idea. And I'm, I'm not sure where it came from, but I love that idea. Because, you know, you lay out your capital improvement plan. We submit, here's what we need to do. Here's how much we need. You use the surcharge. And when you're done, you're done. And the rate payers know what it has to be used That's right. for. No. And they understand the importance of it. I love that idea. Actually, I love that idea a lot. <coughs> um, of all the things that we can do, that's, if I don't know if that's normal, you know, if that's a normal, has been in the past it's to be able to do normal. that. But not normal. We're, we're trying to make it normal. Well, that would be good. Because I, I like that a lot. Yeah. Ms. Cromer, uh, do you have anything? We, we will have some comments at some point, but no questions. Okay. Anything from staff? Yeah. If there's nothing else, Mr. Kerr, you can step down and, and we can hear from Mr. Hines. I don't think, Mr. Schmidt, that you ever put Mr. Kerr on the road. He did. He did. That's a very good one. Okay. Yeah. All right. I, 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 you might have been talking to Mr. Heisman when he was okay. putting him under oath. <laughs> I was going to make sure we fixed that. All right, Mr. Heisman, he, he did put him under oath. You solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury that testimony about the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. I do. Thank you. Please be seated. Mr. Heisman, we don't have a year to get no. this uh, program started. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. Uh, so, how long? I mean, if we have, let me, let me read to you. What I, we have drafted and discussed yesterday about a timeline, which was basically uh, given to us by a management company which has no interest in this proceeding or in Martin County Water District. By December 31st, 2018, Martin District shall issue requests for proposals for management services of all of its operations to each entity identified in Appendix B of the Commission's order dated November 5th, 2018, and in addition, advertise for such proposals between December 31st, 18, and January 14, 19, and at least one local newspaper and one newspaper of statewide circulation. Two, conduct a pre-proposal conference and facilities tour on January 16th and 17th, 2019, and make available on those dates system information package to each interested party. Three, establish a deadline by January 28, 2019 for questions by interested parties. 
Responses to each question shall be provided by Martin District by no later than February 11, 2019. Four, statements of qualification and proposals shall be received and accepted by Martin District up to including March 1, 2019, with copies of each proposal received to be sent to the Commission by no later than March 5th. Uh, number five, proposals shall be reviewed between March 4th by you all and March 15th, 2019. Six, Martin District shall submit its detailed recommendations as required by the Commission order dated November 5th, 2018, on or before April 1st, 2019. That's two weeks to submit rec your recommendations. Seven, a formal conference shall be held on April 9th, 2019 at 10 a.m. Eastern Time here uh, for the purpose of discussing the proposals, Martin District's recommendations and selection of a contractor. Contractors shall be notified by Martin District immediately following selection. Eight, contract negotiations shall be held between April 10th and April 19th with a proposed contract to be submitted to this commission for review on or before April 22nd. A review of the proposed contract shall be conducted by this commission by way of a formal conference with you all uh, uh, on April 25th, 2019, approved contract to be executed on or before April 30th. I mean, are those dates, I mean, those dates are longer than the two proposals that I've seen here for troublesome creep in Sagersville. I mean, why won't those work? It, what is the source? Make sure I understand what is the source of what you just read. Uh, the source uh, is uh, this commission. <laughs> yeah, it's this commission. But we got it from the utility management group, so, which ma which manages Pikeville, who, at my request, after a meeting, uh, basically provided us with this with an alternative to this one-year plan. And, and not looking, listening to you, but not looking at it specifically. I think that is a very clear my initial response to that is that's a very clear and orderly process to go through what we would need to do essentially is pre prepare the document on the front end the actual RFP and the purpose of the clarification and I think I have a better understanding now but I would like to add some questions to clarify for the purpose of the scope of the RFP um, that sounds like a reasonable schedule um, the front end of the process before we start this to make it public we have to prepare a document that essentially that would be made public that would be typically called a RFP um, as I had submitted to Brian who submitted uh, as part of this motion is some processes for this uh, use a one-step process some use a two some use a three and what I had indicated was that from my view it might be best to do a two-step process find out who is interested and who is qualified essentially then create a short list and then what would happen is then ask that short list of say three firms as an example for a specific pro proposal one of the reasons I did that was in order to be able to work in parallel uh, and the reason I'm saying that is in my review of the schedule as we've seen through this past year in my experience is the records that are available um, are generally not available to be able for a contract company to come in and make an assessment of what will be required and the risk associated with it we have to provide them information financial information audit information water quality information public records from the service commission Etc. Cetera, Etc. Cetera. It's and like trying to do a depreciation study where you don't have any records of how old anything is, right? Correct. And, that's kind of <laughs> and the the less information provided to a potential bidder or proposer, the higher the cost it's going to be because there is a risk associated with the the unknown. So, in my judgment, based upon what I was interpreting when I met with Brian and with um, and with Jimmy and we had a conference call and that was about I could look at my notes but about the second week in November was is the Commission asking us one of two things to retain a contract manager 
a person because the finding portions of the order indicate, as Mr. Kerr has already testified, that we have not been successful in getting a competent, capable general manager, and we agree. And therefore, a portion of the order on the front end was the RFP should go out and get a competent, capable contract manager, a person. That process could be done in easily in 30 to 60 days. That doesn't require all the background information of complete operations, maintenance, and management. That's one scenario. In the specifics of the order, in the summary of the order that we talked and you briefed us earlier, I am reading, and I want to validate this because it will determine the scope of the RFP, is that the commission's order intends for us to essentially provide complete contract operations. So it would be management, the maintenance, the operations, construction services. It would include taking the employees. That's correct. It would include the billing, the computer systems, the fleet management, essentially what would typically be a complete contract operations. In, a, in that scenario that, that you have just validated, in my judgment, that is, requires more diligence on the front end to be able to make it clear to prospective proposers what we have available for them. So in my judgment, in that scenario, we need to compile that information. Typically that is provided in either paper copy or an electronic data room and provide that as part of the RFP process. So the schedule that I laid out and in, in, in the order, I said it is a conservative approach. I worked from the objective that we get a year, essentially that we have the plan in place. So I looked at November 5th, 2019, and essentially worked backwards to be able to fill in the elements to have an orderly process to get us to that point. Now, a second point I would like to make is as I'm preparing the RFP, and I have started, I, I would estimate that my RFP, I, I stopped on it simply because I needed clarification because the RFP is two pages. If it's just a contract manager, it's 10 to 15 pages that if it is a complete contract operations. I stopped because we need to identify, and you've helped today, identify the source of revenue or the source of funds, I should say, that will be used to pay the contractor. Because a, a contractor is not going to enter into an agreement without the ability to be paid. And I understand that that is the purpose of surcharge number two, to be able to give the ability, and, and you had indicated just earlier today, that you would be flexible in then allowing that surcharge to come sooner if necessary. Because I can't imagine a contractor will enter into an agreement to perform work without the assurances of being able to be paid. That's why we can alter that anytime somebody says, and, and, and that, that, that helps out, which allows me to put that into the RFP, that that can then be allowed. Because otherwise, the risk will be greater for the contractor not knowing if or when he would be paid. And that's a serious situation because we, we, we look at the history of folks that have not Mr. been Cumbo paid. Knows. I, I know because I have not been paid. <laughs> Mr. Cumbo knows he has not been paid, and certainly Linda Sumner knows, uh, along with the other creditors that, that add up to about a million dollars. So the point I want to make is if this was a, a, a uh, not a well-managed, a average managed entity that had the existing documents that a process like this could would typically take from the start of let's start drafting the RFP to be able to have under contract a done deal would typically take six months and with incremental steps because things I recognize we're going to have to come back to the commission to, to get certain approvals or concurrences with who we select and have to come back to the commission to say we need this assurance of this revenue or these funds in order to be able to pay the contractor before we actually 
finalize the contract, enter into the contract. So based upon what you have read, that sounds like a reasonable schedule. Uh, utility management group, for example, who, who uh, contracted with the Mountain Water District and Pikeville, uh, when there is an existing practice, when this has been done before for a utility, it's pretty easy to be able to assemble that and put that together going forward. This has never been done for the Martin Water District, and the records essentially don't exist. So we have to cobble together as best we can the best information to make it a reasonable amount of information for a prospective contractor to put a proposal in. Otherwise, we run the risk of not getting any proposals at all because the risk is too great. So, so can I can interrupt for just for one second yes, sir. of your commentary? I understand what you're saying. Anybody that's going to come in is going to do a certain amount of due diligence, and, and that's because they're going to determine what the risk is and what it's going to require for them to enter into a, a process like this. But actually, Martin County has is further ahead than they think they are. They've been dealing with this commission for the last two years, providing financial information in particular, which is what they're going to focus on, any management company. Those records are already, if they aren't current, there's already enough preparation that have been done that, that it's going to make this process a lot easier than what I think you're describing. I I hope you are correct. Um, the good part about it is much of the information that you're citing, some of it is dated, but much of the information is available on the Kentucky Public Service Commission website, which would be a reference as part of this process. Part of our past orders include updating our financial people on a periodic basis with the most current information. So that's, that's in the process it, going forward. I, I, because of the orders that have been and, issued. And, and that's, I, I agree with you. But as you are aware, uh, we do not have recent <coughs> documented audits that have been completed. Well, I think you have them. You just haven't paid for them, so you can't get them. Correct. Okay. So and, the information and that go, is That goes there. back to 16, and now we're going to be in 19. So right. we do well, not have audits of 17 and certainly not 18. No, but nobody has 2018 because Correct. No matter who you are, you don't have 18. It's 17 is going to be the most current period that anybody is going to be able to look at. So we're still talking about a My understanding is 16 is the information, but we don't have access to it because it's not being paid for it, and we have a blank for 17. Why don't somebody pay them? Why, why, why doesn't somebody pay them? I mean, I, I look, you know, it's a violation of law, not just us. I mean, I, I've looked at Public Service Commission things, and they've got, we got a dozen water districts out there, almost all from eastern Kentucky. They, they, we haven't paid, they haven't, some haven't had an audit in three years because they, they don't, they can't pay for it. Well, you, you understand that, uh, that under uh, KRS Chapter 65, these things are legally obligated to have, and these commissioners yes, ought to be personally responsible. Yes. I mean, what does it cost? Ten, fifteen, twenty thousand dollars $20,000? Pay the people. Yes, I understand, and now that the, the the debt surcharge has been approved and the approval for payments, payments are being made with the approval of the commission that has just been recently granted. So they will be paid. Hopefully we can get that information. But the point I want to make is, is that based upon where we are now, what it will take is more than 30 days for us to be able to process this RFP. And now that I understand that you want a complete contract operations that, that has now been validated today that allows me to finish the scope of the RFP and then issue that RFP in January with a schedule. I would like if possible if you would share that schedule with uh, us. We're going to schedule, it's going to be in an order. And so therefore then what will comply is we'll proceed forward with that process and then hopefully meet the expectations, essentially, of both the board as well as the commission. All we can do is try. That's Look, correct. we got to try. That, I, how, I much totally time, agree. how much time do you need, do you think, for, a, for an RF to have the RFP prepared? I, I think if you provide that information and that we have taken into consideration the next two weeks for the holidays, but I would expect that we would be able to issue, issue the RFP um, mid 
the, the second or third week of January is what I would January expect. January 15th? I would, what I would say is that not looking at a specific calendar, but let's look at the... <coughs> so we got one. Let's get Hang a date. On. January 15th typically is what I would Monday is a Tuesday. What I would suggest is let's do that Friday of that week. It's Friday, January 18th. Let, okay, let's give let's you, set that. That gives you a month. Essentially, you know, yeah. a month uh, other than the vacation time. But that's correct. And then, then we move forward with the process, all I would do is ask you to look at the tighter the schedule. I, know, I, I, I don't want to in any way discredit what has been provided to you by utility management group. They have done this for other utilities. And if you're in a positive, proactive position where you have lots of information records available, then the process will go quicker. The tighter we place expectations on a deliverable someone in the process is going to say I'm not going to take that risk it reduces the number of potential proposals or bidders or proposers and it will drive up the cost associated with the process so, so, so there's a there's a point there is a balance but just for a clarification to put out a request for proposal or a request for bid you're going to put together, and I've looked at some of the boilerplate language that exists out here that the chairman is referring to. Yes. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel. Correct. Okay. That language that falls at the back of the proposal is pretty standard. You're going to describe in this request for proposal a some statements of what is required of the management firm to do. Yes. The difficulty that I think you're referring to comes after that. When that those bidders say, what is it that you're expecting us to do and provide us detail, that's when they come back and say, what's your financial statements for 2017? What's your, what, what are you doing now as far as your operations go? That's where your time is going to come in. Putting out the initial request shouldn't be the difficult part. I agree, and that's why I originally said, recommended, a two-part process. Get a request out. Who's interested? Give us qualifications. Give us your interest and receive that from two, three, five, ten firms, which allows us in parallel to be building that other information. So when those firms are selected, you have that. This particular proposal is not a two-step process. Essentially, it is one, a RFP. And when the RFP is issued, the typical practice is the RFP is issued and all that information is in the body of that RFP. If we don't do that, then I have to write an RFP that says we will provide that at a later date. Let's say we say we'll provide it by February 15th or provide it by March 15th. Individuals have to put together, quote, a proposal, but they don't have understand the content of what they're proposing on and, and again understand what we're dealing here they have to assess the billing system they have to assess the employees they have to assess in order to make their proposal the compliance for floor quality their role for infrastructure replacement their role in plan for reducing the water loss they have to manage the fleet they have to do the monthly operating reports. So the, the, the point I want to make is they have to make that assessment and they have to look how is it done today. And we all agree it has not been done well by any measure thus far. So, so I understand what you're saying, but you're describing, in my view, a, a two-step process rather than a one-step process. If you look at the schedule that was laid out, Part of that schedule included a tour facility, a tour of the facility. That, that is and, correct. An opportunity to talk to the management. And those kinds of things are going to be part of that risk assessment that that contractor that, is going to have to take into consideration, which also means when he goes through that, he's going to ask questions about the financials, the operation, what is the equipment. He's going to ask all those questions to, to find out what the detail is. And so 
what I think you're saying is you need to provide that all up front, and I don't think you can do that because you, you can't possibly anticipate and, everything that they're going to ask. With, with the experience and the information that you provided, I will be glad to do that. I'll be glad to not provide that information on the front end and let them discover that through the RFP process itself. They can come down here. We'll give them everything I will, we've got. I will instruct them in the RFP that this information, because that will certainly expedite the process. So essentially it will make available what would be helpful is if you can provide a contact person that we can refer the bidders to to get that information from. They can come from. here. We've got financial analysts. They can talk to anybody they want. And so, we'll, we'll and so can you. If you've got a problem or there's some hold up, just give us a call. I, just, I will. You know. So, so I'll provide that in the RFP that essentially the repository of information to make their judgment on will be from the records of the Public Service Commission. There, there's no water district that's more picked apart than this one. I mean, the information and, and I, is there. And I agree with you. With that, with, with eliminating the need for me or for someone from the district, the accountant, the attorney, et cetera, the operations folks, right. From having to provide that information, the information that will be provided to the public, to proposals, will come from the Public Service Commission but, database. But, but don't limit yourself to telling them you need to go see the Public Service Commission. I, this I, is going totally to have to be a joint I'm, I'm effort com between... I'm completely agree with you. I'm, okay. I'm completely I, on so board. I understand because there may be questions that can only be asked from a and, location and, and, perspective. And, and it, that was my error. I was not viewing the Public Service Commission essentially as a partner with this process it is. associated with securing this particular contract. My fear is if we leave everything up to the district, we'll never get anything done. They have, I mean, with all due respect, they haven't done anything so far. And their, their staff may or may not be up to par. I guess you, I don't even know if that's a debate. It's not. Issue. I mean, it's not. I, I, I think you have to be. I think you have to be aware. And I know you're concerned about our schedule, but you have to. What Mr. Kerr did not provide, you have to recognize that uh, we lost. We do not have our operations manager any longer. We do not have our essentially our administrative person is out currently on leave. So essentially, and we're we're fighting to get to get water into the reservoir in order to be able to reliably supply water. So. We have to recognize this RFP process is important. There's, there's no question. But at the same time, we're, we're just trying to keep the doors open. Yeah, I so, know there's a lot of fires. And, and, and so with in recognizing what we've done over the past two months is one week it is dealing with the RFP. Two days later, it's dealing with the issue of our chairman resigning. Or a few days later, it is the ability to apply for an additional grant or get grant clarification for future infrastructure. So. I want to say that we're working in parallel on a number of fronts to be able to keep the ship afloat and as best we can. I'm more familiar with Martin County than, than I am any other utility that we regulate. So yes, I, I know there's priorities. And, and, and therefore, when I, when I built the schedule, I to be honest with you, I took what a typical schedule would be and I added time to it because my experience with Martin County and with this process is that Whatever time I would think it would take, it usually takes twice as much time. <laughs> well, we've got to do. We've got to expedite it, no matter what it takes. If I have to go over there myself and sift through records with Mr. Cumbo so we can get them this stuff, but we, we've got it. We've we'll, got we'll, we'll take you up on that offer. We'll take you up on that offer. We need everybody we can get. <laughs> believe me, I, I believe it. So, so <laughs> I, I guess my view, what what has been clear been clarified for me that helps me then close this out to, to proceed is I will proceed forward with preparing the RFP issuing that by that Friday the 21st I believe it was 18th. Friday, sorry, 18th. 18th. by the 18th and then the schedule what the comment that I would make is to you is the schedule that you had cited sounded reasonable but I would ask you to look at the time that quote this proposal is on the street so to speak to make sure that we have adequate time for the contractors to do their due diligence to be able to put together a reasonable proposal 
based upon the information that is out there. It, it will include typically all of these require, typically you have a data room and typically you have a conference meeting and you have a tour of the facilities which is included mm -hmm. in your schedule and then typically you have a period of time for the contractors to ask questions of clarification and then typically two, you close that and typically then one to two weeks after that are, is when the actual proposals are due and then we have to assemble an evaluation team that typically would be three to five individuals and then we would then rate those proposals. Three to five individuals other than you from the district, right? It, it, it would be up to, in, in my judgment, what we have discussed is that the ad district, um, the Big Sandy ad, would assist with the administration of this process. And then I would be the consultant and then it would be up, what I would recommend to the board is two board members, possibly an individual appointed by the new county judge that essentially would serve on this committee. So the advisors into this process would be the Big Sandy Ad staff member facilitating the process, and also I would serve to facilitate the process. The decision making would be performed by those in accountable authority uh, that would be two from the district, possibly one either at large citizen or one individual from appointed by the county judge. Typically you would have at least three sometimes you have as many as five so essentially they need to assemble and whether you receive two three four five ten proposals they all have to be evaluated understand the more proposals there are the longer it will take to rank the proposals typically what i will say also is you do a, a two-part process in the review of the proposals you will not look at the cost you'll look at the qualifications first so you're not biased by the cost and you will look at what is the do they have the cap the competency what is their plan what's their schedule etc and you will rank those and then you'll bring cost into play as well so it's a combination of qualifications as well as cost that would come in to make a then a decision sometimes you shortlist if we had 10 proposals you might shortlist to three firms and then essentially sometimes you'll do interviews it's a matter of if you want to engage and have interviews with, I can't recall if that particular schedule included <coughs> interviews of the actual contractors selected. But again, you have to schedule interviews. If you do not decide to do interviews, then again, that's an element of risk. Then the board would make, essentially this group would make a recommendation to the full board of the district. The full board of the district would then make a recommendation to award a contract contingent upon XYZ, approval of the commission, then that would be handed to Brian, who would then report it to the commission for approval. And at that point, you still haven't, you don't have a contract. So then if the commission then approves it, then what would happen is making sure that there is available funding available to pay for the contractor through the surcharge. And then you get the contract language, put a contract together, Essentially, Brian would represent the district for the contract language. You negotiate the final details of the contract, execute a contract. Typically, that can take anywhere from 30 to 45 days in order to be able to, to go through that process for both parties to finalize negotiation of the contract. Once you have the money, the contract's easy, isn't it? Um, How many of these contracts are more, more boilerplate than any? Well, it, it's a matter of whether we allow the proposer to provide the contract and Mr. Cumbo reviews it or whether Mr. Cumbo prepares a contract because no contract language exists right now. So essentially what we would do I'm going to tell you this. Yes sir. My personal. We're not going to let this district have any discretion to do anything. We're going to get a contract and, we, and you can negotiate based on their contract. We'll never finish. Okay so. We'll never finish. So that would be additional assistance Cumbo, to me that what we'll put in the RFP is that what we will do is the contractor will provide, propose the contract language and there's a fiduciary responsibility of the board to have Mr. Cumbo review that contract and that will help expedite but understand. Well, we'll be reviewing it too. Uh, I'm a lawyer and we've got 
12 lawyers. Yes. Down. We'll all look at it. Yes. Yeah. So then that would be a second process that has to come back to the commission to be able to, here's the contract. You'll be reviewing it. Ryan will be reviewing it. And then that contract signed off. And then typically because we have employees at stake, assets at stake, et cetera, there has to essentially be a transition period. And typically, depending on the complexity of those transition periods, they could be 30 days, maybe 60 days. And so when I laid out the plan, I was going from where we are now to understand the scope all the way to where we're under complete contract and the transition's complete. We're going to go through as fast as we can, like the schedule, and we'll see how it works out. And if, if there's something needs to be adjusted, we can adjust it. Let's try not to. And, I understand. And don't wait 32 days to ask for whether or not a, an ordering paragraph that says prepare and issue an RFP for operational management services to entities which specialize in providing such services, including but not limited to those entities identified in Appendix B. Don't wait 32 days to ask is that one person or is that an, an entity? Well, it, it's an entity. It says an entity. I, I, I understand. I have one other question for clarification that will help me to finalize this is there is um, in the order essentially uh, the requirement to develop a, for lack of a specific term, an infrastructure plan to be able you know, to address. That's later. And there may not need to be an infrastructure plan. At I, this I understand point. that. My question is um, as part of this process, in your opinion, or in your order, do you want me to include that it will be the responsibility of that contractor at a later date to conduct, to perform that and develop that plan? I think the contractor ought to develop that plan, but since the contractor is not going to be on board for a while, that plan can be extended Correct. so that he ha it has some time to do that. So, and that helps me clarify that in the RFP, it will be an obligation of the contractor to develop that plan, not for the proposal, but develop that plan to be delivered at a later date. Obviously, they have to learn a lot about the district in order to be able to develop the plan because they're going to have to have a chart and we're going to know what sections are going to be replaced Correct. and have their plan to do it, right? Yes. Assuming when funds yeah, are available. For, for any contractor coming in, and I'll speak from my own experience, Having a year and a half ago, I did not know anything about the Martin County Water District. There will be a lot to learn uh, by any contractor uh, doing this this particular work. So that then helps clarify the final piece for me to set the expectation of what the obligation for the contractor would be. Uh, once the contract is awarded, they work on developing a plan that is then submitted back uh, for purposes of infrastructure improvements. So this, if this dialogue. Else, is there any question? If somebody says, "Well, there's some issue about this infrastructure plan," you call us. Right? We'll yes. fix it. Right? I understand. Okay. Miss Cromer, you and you and Mr. Gardner, I'm I'm ready to uh, uh, basically try to get file a motion for sainthood for uh, <laughs> for your your actions here and your patience. What have you, what have you got to say? Please, just, we'd just, like to hear your position. Just a couple of things, if, if you would, Your Honor. First of all, when, when I saw the order when it came out, uh, I, I thought that the, the rate increase that the commission had given, 36%, was generous. And uh, I thought that the timetable, what you all put in the order, was not ambiguous. It was clear. I thought that was incredibly generous, you know, basically. And so it was surprising when they filed their motion. It's it's almost as if, and you can see this, that they they look for ambiguity when ambiguity doesn't exist. You give them 36 percent, but you all have to do this, and it's like, you know, well, do we really have to do this? So all of what you all said today about the order that you're going to that will follow this as little ambiguity as possible in there is is going to be what we would request and that the timetable just like you all said as tight as short as possible um, because you know that they will come back with questions and you know that there will 
again, be amb ambiguity when, when none has, uh, none is there. The, the, the other thing is, is also from your experience that, we, that the citizens group will not be included in anything voluntarily. So we heard that um, um, uh, Attorney Cromer had to um, make a make a you know open records request to try to see what's happened. And I would suggest this, Ms. Cromer. And I saw. I mean, you you've been more than kind to these people. If I didn't get a, a reasonable response in time, I'd go to the Attorney General. <coughs> I, I, I wouldn't. That's what I'd do. I'm not saying you will, whatever you want to do, but, but uh, you know, uh, that, that, that kind of stuff. That would just not, and I agree with everything you say. Yeah. I think that the district has delayed unduly. Uh, and I, we're going to do our best to see that doesn't happen if we have to end. We have to exact sanctions against the commissioners. Or, I mean, I, I personally, I'm ready. Uh, I mean, I, I understand Mr. Kerr's doing the best he can. He's got a staff over there that may not be very good, but somehow somebody has to change. Something just has to change. And, and, and so on that, that point about their involvement and inclusion, it, so they had, I understand the law gives them 30 days to respond, but, you know, from your questions of uh, Mr. Kerr, there was hardly anything there to respond to during that time period, but yet use the, the 30 days. There was enough time to prepare this motion. There was enough time for to prepare the motion, the multi-page document and affidavit for trying to keep the former chair on. So, so, but so specifically, and this is the last thing I'll say, is we would like to have the involvement of a representative of the citizens group at, the, at appropriate times in this process so that they do not have to, you know, be on the outside. There's no reason, and um, there's no reason that they have to be on the outside. If, we're, if there's going to be an advisory and evaluation committee, there ought to be a representative of the citizens group on that committee. There's no indication that they have been anything other than constructive in this process. There's no indication that they would do anything other than continue to be instructive. But there's no reason. They can't be included at appropriate times in the process if there's that evaluation. Well, let's ask, what do you what, what do you say, Mr. Kerr? I feel like we have included them in, at every step. I mean, I don't know. I mean, I do. I mean, I don't. Other than this open records request, what haven't we done? We provide them with our financials at every single meeting. So, so Here, here's what I here's what I here's what I think. Uh, I think that they ought to be they being the district, Mr. Heisman, and whoever. They're the ones who are legally responsible for doing this, and they're the ones that are ultimately accountable to us. So I, I think that suggestion ought to be denied. But everything they do is going to be in public. You're going to get copies. You'll see when they file things here, proposals or whatever. One of the things that I regretted, when the day after this order went out, I looked at it again and said, you know what? They've got from now till January 30th, and we'll never hear the first thing, <laughs> you know, and, and that was the way it was. But we tried to do, to have a tight schedule in this order. But as, as requests for proposals, as they have to furnish things to us, they'll all be here, you know, and, and you'll be able to have access to them, and you can make comments. You'll have copies of the contract, the, the proposals. They'll come to us. And we could require them to send copies to you. That, that, at a minimum, that would be great. But, you know, we heard Mr. And then Ryan you can come and have public comment. I mean, you, we'll have at least two formal conferences. Mr. Heisman, he was the one who even suggested that there be a representative from the public on the, that particular committee. Well, yeah. I, I guess there's some question as to where the public's from, right? what the public's interests are. I mean, I've talked to Ms. McCoy numerous times about doing that. I've even formed a committee that, with emergency management, so if we have a problem this winter that we're prepared for that, the concerned citizens are fully involved in that. I mean, I give them, every, I mean, I don't know what I haven't done, Mary, as far as not provided. I mean, I've tried to be very open and transparent because I'm all about the concerns. I've been to their meetings. I've, you know, when I got yelled at at their meetings, I've, I've done everything. I'm not, I don't follow that or 
I'm sorry, I, I just don't. I'm well, no, and it, it's nothing personal at all. We would just, yeah. you know, we would just like to have formal inclusion in the process, and and I think to ensure that that happens, we were asking that that be part of the order that we well, be. I guess the question is, included. who who what, who is it that's going to be? It, would be your representative. I mean, I, I can I see we likely know that would, would yeah. I so, mean, but but also, and, and just to your point, that we will be getting the proposals. If I understand the way that the timeline that Mr. Heitzman laid out, and I may not fully understand, would work, there would be a lot of um, work at the district level to review those proposals before they come to the commission. The, the, so. Well, we'll have if we. All of the timeline, it'll just be about a period of a couple of weeks. But they get the proposals under under this scenario on a Friday, and by the following Tuesday, we'd have to have them. Okay. So they'd be public, and we could include that they would forward copies to you as well. Okay. And and you know we would also like to be part of the review of the contract um, and the markup of the well, contract. Well, when the contract's package. reviewed, I mean, I they're gonna. I, I don't think that would be appropriate. Uh, but I think when they come down here to discuss the contract, you obviously can have people, or if you want to have an expert, or you want to discuss some questions about it, you could file something in advance so that we, you know, have something, because you'll have that information, where, you know, a week or so. I mean, it was my, I don't mean to wrap, I'm sorry. I mean, it was even my intention to have you and Miss McCoy, when we do the grading, at the district level to have you guys involved in that. I mean, like I said, it's as much your, you know, the citizens group as it is. I mean, I'm part of your group, essentially. So, no, we absolutely intend to have you guys included. Actually, I think from a commission standpoint, it's better if you work voluntarily together than for the commission yeah, to order. I felt like we had. I mean, I felt like I tried to do that. I don't, I, like I said, I don't know. I'm just kind of surprised by that because I'm very open. But, 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 I'm sorry, this is an example of appreciate what he's saying, but the reality was is when Mary requested you know, basically information regarding the status of the, you know, compliance with the putting out stuff, it's, you know, you get the, the 30 days, no, we're not going to give you that information, which is their right, which is legal there, and then the blame goes to somebody else. The blame well, yeah, goes to well, we need to address that right now. Okay, Mr. Kerr, uh, things like that, is that on you or are you going to throw Mr. Cumbo on it? Well, I guess ultimately it's on me. <laughs> well, let me jump in here, and I don't want to fall on my sword. Uh, let, let me just share a little history of these uh, open records requests. Is is I We get those open records requests, and we have folks at the Water District, number one, who don't know where any of this stuff is, who are running around trying to put out fires and don't want to hear me calling begging for this stuff. And it just takes time to get it. So I developed a form letter about eight or ten months ago that every time we get one, and it's not just from these people, it's from everybody else that says, golly gee, we you are more swamped. Than this year, right? <laughs> <laughs> you know, and we're going to get to it just as quick as we can, and then I start begging for it. And, and sometimes we get it sooner than that, and sometimes we don't. But it's not Mr. Kerr's fault, and it's not Greg... Uh, What's his last name? Scott. 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 Not Greg Scott's fault. It, it's everybody's fault because we're our system that is in disarray, and and I can't expect Greg Scott to to ignore three water line breaks that he's working on and a piece of equipment that's broke down. Drop whatever you're doing and get me these documents that they've requested. You know, we they get to it just as quickly as they can and. You know, it's, like, a, it's like a system a structure, in crisis. We'd like to have a structured ending, but we understand it's we go through chaos to get there. And, and, <laughs> and you know, but you know, so in Mr. Kerr's defense, I I generate that letter. I didn't ask him, "Hey, do you want me to send this letter saying we get 30 more days?" I did it because it has been my practice, it has been my experience that it takes time to get this stuff because everybody else is running around putting out fires. And may I say? And I just want to say one more thing. Like this, this is not personal to you, Jimmy Don, in any way. You have you have worked well with the group, but we are not working just with you. We were working with the Martin County okay. Water District, so we wanted a more formalized process to make sure that you know you may there's something could happen. You might not be on the board in three months, so we wanted 
you know, some My insurance. My wife has anything to say, it won't be. <laughs> I'd, I'd like, here. may I make one statement? Yes, you may. Is it, it recognizing, I think, over the past year, essentially these requests, which we understand are appropriate for every hour that we would spend in searching and providing responses to the Attorney General with that investigation, open records requests, putting out the fires, it is an hour that is not spent proactively on putting together an RFP, as an example. And I, I want, the, my point I want to make is I'm very thankful that the Commission has recognized that as we go through this process, these requests and the timing, et cetera, they're not going to stop. We're, we're going to have the same events that are going to occur over the next three months while we're going through this process that we have seen over the past, or I've seen over the past 18 months. So I very much appreciate the commission willing as we go through here that we can contact you to be able to say we've had X event and if necessary, expectations can change. Because that, that's what we have to, um, want to set the right expectations that we can have on paper in a perfect world that we can achieve XYZ within 45 days. But the reality is, is that unforeseen circumstances may present themselves that we have to make sure that we protect public health and safety with the obligations as best we can to the customers. We can't stop Ms. McComber from making a request, but I think that she ought to get, and we can talk about uh, copies of proposals and draft contract, or so you'll have this information too. And if you didn't, it's going to be right here, so you're going to be able to log on and get it. But, uh, but anything else? I, I have one last thing. So I, I said that I would ask this question of you after I asked Mr. Kerr. Yes. And that was what the priorities are for spending the $3.4 million grant money, whether it's the water plant or whether it's service lines or what exactly it is. And I know that he indicated there's obviously the pumps at the river are a priority regardless, but I think their value is $500,000 or something like that, which leaves about $3 million for improvements either to the water plant or fixing mains and service lines. He indicated that from his financial perspective, it's probably fixing mains and service lines. I'd like to hear I'm, your opinion. I'm a licensed professional engineer in Kentucky, and in my professional opinion, uh, the most important priority at this point in time is addressing the, the deficiencies in the source of supply the transition of that water to the Crumb Reservoir, to the treatment plant, and the clarifier. And the reason is simply is this, is in layman's terms, if we don't have water going into the plant, it doesn't matter how much water we lose in the pipes. Now that doesn't mean that water loss is not important, but we have existing failures of infrastructure as we speak, the existing electric pumps are not operating and that is a priority the now, value of that is 500,000 are the two 250,000 dollar pumps there are two pumps right. but the supply line from the intake okay. currently is silted up so you can have two operating pumps but essentially the supply line to the intake pumps are not going to properly operate or they're going to get silted up or damaged so this is a essentially a whole host of issues and as you heard earlier, we have a failed clarifier that has been failed for many years. We only have two that are operating that run virtually 24 hours, 24 seven. If we have another failure of one of those two clarifiers, then essentially we're out of business. Now, the other thing I want to make sure that is clear, and I've testified this effect before, is over excuse a year ago. Excuse me, Mr. Smith. Commissioner Snavely, Secretary Snavely, I, I know you have to leave. Is that I didn't know if your people, we could have, uh, the engineer from Bell is here, who can meet with your people and, and they understand uh, that we can do that any time and finish up. So I know maybe you can't be here. Uh, okay, I'm sorry. Go, go ahead. Now, the other thing I would like to clarify is uh, Mr. Gary Laramore of Kentucky Rural Water and I met uh, with various funding agencies 
primarily uh, Sandy Donahue with the Department of Local Government to, to determine what are available funds, this was over a year ago, available grant funds that could be used for Martin County that the Department of Local Government and KIA, and we were put on the path of um, ARC funding, and we, as you're aware, we were successful in getting a $1.2 million grant. And our conclusion at the time is to have that grant focus on service lines and meters because that is the data that we have is that is where the largest amount of leakage in the system is. So we specifically did that to address the concerns, to be step one of many steps to address the concerns of the failing distribution infrastructure. I personally met with Mr. Scott, who just left, who heads up the AML program. And I said, we would like to be able to configure and apply for a grant under the AML program. And at the time, there were two parts to the AML program, the regular AML program and what's called the pilot AML portion, which is a fairly new program. And I had to be educated on this, but I was advised by Mr. Scott that the pilot AML program, in order to, to make it attractive for the federal government to approve it, it must be tied to economic development, whereas the regular AML program does not. So. The, if the AML, the 3.4 million, is broken into two parts, approximately 2.2 million is for economic development, and approximately 1.2 million dollar is the regular program. Well, in the economic development, our judgment was, my judgment, in advising the, the, the district, is, is that we have to have a project that would tie to economic development, and in my opinion, replacing a service line or a pipe replacement does not directly tie into economic development. Therefore, we may not be eligible to get the grant. Whereas I discussed with Mr. Scott the concept that if we don't have a reliable water supply to the entire county, there is no economic development. So we configured a project around the plant to be eligible for a grant that requires a connection to economic development. The second part, it's part one of the 2.2 of the 3.4 million. And we used information from the Kentucky Engineering Group of what they had identified as priorities with the SCADA system, the intake pumps, the supply line to the reservoir, a bypass to the reservoir, and the clarifier. So that's the basis for why we went to AML because of the economic development time. If we don't have an economic development time, there is no AML grant for the 2.2 million. The other part of the AML grant, the 1.1 million, essentially what we did is we decided to tie that into the plant work because of the amount of work being done. And the reason is this, is that there are no longer, my understanding, I'm not an expert on AML, but listening to Bob Scott, he had advised me and my understanding is, is that there are no areas of Martin County that are eligible for any new AML projects. So if we were to do any type of main replacement work or improvement work, it would have to tie into where AML money has been spent before. For example, if AML funded a replacement project along Road X, then we could go in and identify that Road X to be replaced using the AML funds. So hearing all of that, my recommendation to the board was Take two approaches. Go with ARC funding for the service lines and meters. And if we're successful there, then go with additional main replacement and take and leverage the AML funding for economic development and focus on the plant. So, so here's, that, here's, here's my comment to that. Yes, sir. So my question was, what did you think were the priorities? And you have based everything on your interpretation of whether there's economic development involved in the requirement for spending the funds. And I understand that there's lots of opinions on what constitutes economic development and whether a water main replacement that goes to an area that's already established of whether that constitutes any economic development. But just so that I understand, your priorities are being influenced by your interpretation of what constitutes economic development. 
Is that, that a correct statement? It, it, no, I would, I would qualify it this way. In, independent of the AML, of the, of the federal grant funding, ARC or AML, independent of that, my professional opinion is the highest priority is to just put the investment in the reliability of the source water and the treatment first. Even and I know, I know that is different than what Mr. Kerr. Well, okay, that so is my you. that is my judgment. From a financial perspective, knowing that 70% of the water that's being treated never makes it to the end user, meaning that for every three gallons of every 10 gallons produced, only three gallons make it to the end user. And no matter how good the water is, by the time the user has it, it's already been contaminated because of line breaks or uh, permeation into the system. That, that would seem to be, from a financial perspective, to be a pretty big deal because $200,000 per year could do a lot for other plan improvements. I, I, I agree with you. Uh, the reality is, is that all of this work, both distribution, service lines, meters, plant work, it all is a priority. It's all priority A. And so, but if I have to take the most, in my judgment, you ask what is the highest priority, in my opinion, now, a different professional engineer may give you a different opinion. And a financial person with your background may have a different, I respect that opinion. Uh, but from my perspective, you have to have a reliable source of supply and a reliable treatment process that is the first obligation of a water system for public health and safety. So at that, least that, I, that is my perspective. But with, that's fine, which is what I asked. But at least I, I think the commission understands better why we keep hearing two different stories. And the reason why we keep hearing two different stories is because two sources have two different opinions. And uh, I know that Secretary Snavely was concerned because of what he thought were priorities and then other sources claiming that there were other priorities and I guess it's going to come down to somebody making a decision somewhere. We're just trying to make sure the money's spent in the best way possible. And I know in the 1.2 million, it was supposed to be a thousand service lines replaced and the initial proposal shows that maybe half of that amount will be done with 1.2 million, which then we start to get into this you know, are we getting pie in the sky numbers or are we getting reality numbers or, or what's going on? The, the money needs to be spent that benefits the most that we can possibly have a benefit knowing that the, the system itself is going to require 14 to 15 million dollars to make it operate the way it's supposed to and, and we've got so far 4.6 million, basically a third of any amount that's needed. So there's, it, it, we need to make sure that it's spent in the best way possible. Well, and, and maybe to help the commission uh, get to the point, if uh, because this is this decision process is influenced by the grant availability and the criteria requirements of the grant. So it, it may be helpful in the future to get information specifically for the commission from Mr. Scott, who advised me what Martin County is eligible for, because if you can't apply for a grant if you don't meet the eligibility you won't get it so we're trying to optimize the grant availability provide the best overall value collectively and, and i think from a the commission district. perspective our goal is to take the focus on where money is going to be sourced from in other words grant money is not always the answer what and another reason why we're looking to surcharges because that's a philosophy that exists across kentucky and in particularly in eastern Kentucky. And those monies are drying up. And the only way that infrastructure is going to be replaced is if the local district starts spending money through a pipeline replacement program, similar to what the, what the gas companies have or whatever, but it can't be just through grant money. And, and I totally agree with you. I absolutely agree with you. And our intention, of which I had advised the board, is once we stabilize with our base rates, which is underway, and then get our contract manager underway, get our capital plan, then the full intent is to essentially come back and say, we want to do project A, and it would require this amount of funding, and come back to the commission to request a surcharge to replace X 
pipe, Y pipe, Z pipe, or X meter, Y meter, Z meter. So I fully appreciate it, the support that you're giving because I do agree that we in Kentucky, we need to wean ourselves off the requirements of the federal government in order to be able to subsidize the systems. We need to, to get the true cost of water and recognize that essentially ratepayers are going to have to pay the full cost for providing public water service to their community. Yeah, and unfortunately, because it's been neglected for 20 years through rate increases that were never made, the pain is going to be more severe in the short term. Hopefully, those surcharges then go away and things return to a more reasonable level of cost to the to the consumer. But yeah, it's, it's going to be painful. And I think, I hope most people realize that it's not a quick fix. It's, I agree. It's going to hurt. I, and I'm here. Comments or questions? Well, too, you know, it's, you always think that if customers have skin in the game, they're more likely to take an interest in their local water system and hold it accountable. Of course, Martin County says since it's not skin now, they're in an arm and a leg. I think it's, it's evidenced <laughs> but, by this proceeding. <laughs> but one of the things that always concerned me is why Martin County can has sources of water other than the tug fork of the Big Sandy River. They, I mean, I know their pipe broke down to somewhere yes. in Mingo County, but uh, Kermit. But they could get water from Kermit, water from Mountain Water District in Pike County, and water from Prestonsburg. Uh, I mean, if their water needs could be met through purchases, and the Public Service Commission controls the price of those purchases, it would seem to me that the better use of money is fixing the leaks, assuming they can buy the water that they otherwise need. That, and that, is, that needs to be evaluated. That has been discussed. I often describe it this way, is, is that right now our existing system is, is plumbed just like the human body. Here's our main pump station. Here's our source. If we would, and our, our pipes go out in our distribution system, just like our arteries and blood vessels, so if you move a particular source of water from here to here, essentially the, the plumbing is going to have to be redone. We have to reposition storage, have to reposition pumping, have to enlarge pipelines. Now that is a legitimate opportunity. I, from what I know, I don't believe um, a significant portion, meaning 40, 50, or 60, or 70 percent could come from adjacent systems, but I do believe a minority portion, 30 percent or less, could come from adjacent water suppliers and be more cost effective. And as we make investments in replacing pipes with the hydraulic model that we talked about earlier, that will help us determine is there a particular pressure zone, as an example, that could be better provided by an adjacent supplier in a more cost effective fashion. That evaluation needs to be a comprehensive look at a, at a multi-year capital plan, hydraulic model planning, to see about the options to essentially wean off or reduce the load off the existing treatment plant and diversify our, our supply sources. So I do agree with you, but we're not in a position right now to have the knowledge of those decisions to be made. That, that will come with part of this capital improvement plan that eventually will be adopted and then put into place. I would just say that once you spend $3.4 million on an intake and plant, then you've just changed your economics on whether or not you're pur purchasing from another system. I mean, then you've got fixed costs that are now sitting in a plant. It, it, unless, unless there is an engineer that can come in and say that we can eliminate the plant 50% or more. Is the plant producing 200 or 2 million gallons of water that meets the division of waters? criteria? Right now the, the plant is running virtually 24 hours a day. It has a 2 million gallon a day capacity and typically um, the Kentucky Division of Water, once you exceed 80% um, requires looking for an additional expansion. Now none of us are, are pr proposing to expand the plant. We're proposing to essentially harden the reliability of the existing source because that is the most emergent need. There, there simply I am not of any aware of any method short of five 
to $10 million investment in replacing all the pipes that will take five years plus in order to do to be able to take our water loss from 70% down to 15%. This is going to be a multi-year process. So in the meantime, we're leveraging the ability to use grant funding for specific purposes to optimize the results. I, I, thank you for the lecture. Anything else? Is there any reason why Mr. Heisman can't be excused? You, you may step down. Thank you. All right, Mr. Heisman, I will say this, and, and, and Mr. Kerr, <clears throat> I had thought that we'd be through here early. I'm, I'm, my mistake. But if we try to get an order out today, and we may be able to get a skeleton order out, but whether we can or can't, we need that proposal out by January the 15th. Yes, sir. It's for proposals. Okay? Even though if the order may go it out. It was January 18th. First, 18th, right. I'm sorry, the 18th. All right, is there anything else? Anything? No, Ms. Cromer? Ms. Cromer, I need to ask you, let's go off the record. <laughs> All right, if there's nothing else,